Good morning, everyone. My name is Emily Underwood. I work in community engagement at the Missouri Historical Society. On behalf of MHS, I'd like to welcome you to this installment of STL History Live. And thank you for joining us virtually today for Twain the Humanitarian. Uh, before we get started, I want to mention a few things. So safety is, of course, a top priority for us. So all of our programming remains virtual at the moment, um, but the museum is open. We're open Wednesday through Sunday. They have several safety precautions in place. Um, we'd love for you to visit if you feel safe doing so. Uh, advanced reservations are required. They're required to visit the History Museum as well as our other two locations, the um, Soldiers Memorial Military Museum. And actually the Library and Research Center is closed to the public right now, um, but you can get remote assistance with research. So if you are interested in that, you can find a contact form on our website, uh, which is mohistory.org. You can also get free tickets for Soldiers Memorial or the History Museum there. This presentation is part of our programming commemorating uh, the Missouri Bicentennial, as well as part of our programming in conjunction with our exhibit, The Mighty Mississippi, which is open at the Missouri History Museum. It's presented by Bank of America. It's going to remain open through June 6th. I want to thank Bank of America for their support of the exhibit, um, as well as our education sponsor, JSM Charitable Trust. I also want to thank all of the Missouri Historical Society members for your support. We're so grateful for your contributions and helping us to keep history alive. And if you aren't a member yet, we would love for you to consider joining today. So you can get more information about our membership programs at mohistory.org backslash support. Um, and I also want to thank everyone in St. Louis City and County for your support and uh, through the tax contributions through the Zoo Museum Tax District. So thank you for that. Our STL History Live programs mostly take place on Tuesdays at 11 and Thursdays at 6.30 p.m. We also have monthly Soldiers, uh, Soldiers Memorial Chow and Chat programs. Those are always on a Wednesday at noon. You can find the entire lineup of all of our programs at mohistory.org. You can go to our events calendar there or on the Missouri History Museum Facebook page. And if you're unable to join us live, or if you just want to go back and rewatch a program, or you loved a program and you want to share it with friends and family, you can also find most of our STL History Live programs um, on the Missouri Historical Society YouTube channel. So be sure to check that out as well. And finally, when you close out of the program today, you're going to notice that a tab should have opened up uh, in your browser with a brief survey. So we always value your feedback. I hope that you'll take a minute or two to fill that out and let us know what you think about the program. Um, we really sincerely appreciate it. So I thank you in advance for that help. And now I'm going to move on to today's program and introduce you to our speaker. Faye Dant is the founder and executive director of Jim's Journey, the Huck Finn Freedom Center in Hannibal, Missouri. Faye is a fifth generation Hannibal resident. Her ancestors were enslaved there and this history inspired her to recover and preserve the history of the black community in Hannibal, both enslaved and free. And her organization works to share these stories as well as the story of Mark Twain's evolving perspectives on race and his relationships with African-Americans. And so that's what she's here to share with us a little bit today. If you have any questions during the program, uh, please post them in the Q&A, not the chat. Please put them in the Q&A. We'll get to as many as we can at the end of the program. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Faye. <laughs> good, good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I, uh, I'd like to talk with you today about uh, Twain, the humanitarian, Sammy, AKA, AKA Mark Twain. And as uh, most of you know, he uh, lived in Hannibal for about 13 years here and uh in a town that's that's everything twain we believe we have created a, a unique commemoration to to twain the humanitarian and uh to the uh, life that he lived uh, after leaving hannibal and some of the positions that he took after leaving hannibal and uh you know th that's what that's what we're going to get into a bit today Good, this is a monument that we have in Hannibal. And as you can see, it, it, it talks about, uh, about the humanitarian. Um, most of you know this, well, if you're at all a Twain, um, interested in Twain or a Twainiac is what we, we call you. Uh, you know that he was born in Florida, Missouri in 1835. He moved to Hannibal as a four-year-old. He moved from Hannibal in 1852, actually, as a 17-year-old. Uh, and then he died out in uh, Connecticut in 19, uh, 1910. What, uh, what I want to add here is that I also grew up in Hannibal. 
I grew up uh, thinking and, and having a, a bad a bad impression of Twain, uh, a bad impression of uh, of him as as a racist and as a person who unnecessarily used a uh, nigger in his in his novel, particularly the one about Jim and Huck, uh, way too many times. So like Twain, I had to unlearn some things uh, after leaving Hannibal. Thank you. Uh, uh, in, in the museum, we talk about the African-American influences. You, you probably know this, that Twain was born into a slave holding family and he absorbed the racist views of the church, the community, his parents, and, and he was powerfully impacted by the things that he learned here. Uh, he, this is a partial list that, that we present at the museum and it's a list of, of individuals, African-Americans that he wrote about or that he met and, and impacted in one way or another. Um, I, I will go into some detail about some of these people, but, but I, I'm reminded of a story out of uh, out of Huck Finn, and that's the one of um, uh, a woman they call, I think he calls her Aunt Sally. And she was speaking with Huck one morning and, and Huck said to her, well, you know, there was an explosion on a steamboat last night. And, Twain, and um, Aunt Sally's response was natural for a good Christian woman. Was anyone hurt? Well, Huck said, no, only a nigger. Uh, Aunt Sally's response was, oh, that's good. And the point is that even the kindest, most humane among people at that time, uh, it, it was hard for them to put their arms around uh, an enslaved person as anyone, as a human, if you will. Uh, Twain, again, like I said, talked about some of his childhood memories and and this is uh, this is kind of an example of, of one of them and that's a memory he had of uh, he was about 10 years old I believe and he had uh, uh, some men and women enslaved people uh, walking in chains headed towards the river uh, towards the auction house to be um, sold down river uh, Twain's um, was pretty mortified by that, as he as he says in his in his book in his memoirs that those were some of the saddest faces he had ever seen. It's kind of interesting to note, though, that that Twain's own family, um, his mom and his mother and his father, uh, both uh, participated in in selling enslaved people downriver, which we know was was the harshest punishment that, that a, a slave enslaved person could have. I mean, not only are you separated from your family and your loved ones, but uh, there, there's no kind of, um, you know, you can't imagine the, the life you're, you're going to have in this new community. Uh, this is uh, an image that I use in the museum and it's, uh, it's, it's about, uh, it, it was actually a stereo view, a 1901 stereo view by a man named W.C. Johnson. And the stereo view is titled, All Coons Look Alike. Well, I use it in the museum to not only show all these kids is that who, who you know, could have very well be the image, I should say, could have very well been Little Sammy's playmates, but also it's, it's symbolic of, uh, of Black Americans on the other side of that fence that that uh, that Twain refers to in Tom Sawyer. Uh, this is uh, again a, an, a, an imagined family: Daniel, Hannah, Harry, and Mary. Daniel, uh, if you know Huck Finn at all, uh, he was one of the prototypes for Jim in Huck Finn, and. Uh, Huck Finn, oh, excuse me, little Sammy would spend summers in Florida Museum, excuse me, in Florida, Missouri, listening to uh, Uncle Daniel and Aunt Hannah's stories, uh, stories being told at the end of a long, hard work day. Um, in, the, in Jim's journey, I, I get to share with you a photograph of, 
of Mary Quarles, as well as some information about Harry Quarles. These are two of the named enslaved children that Daniel and Hannah had. Uh, the, the point is that while young Sammy was learning the art of storytelling, they did not necessarily share with him the hardship, the pain, the powerlessness, all of that associated with the reality of slavery. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the, not only were these childhood memories influences, but once he left Hannibal and began to travel the world and began to experience other things, there were other influences that sort of changed him and uh, I claim that, that Twain became, or Samuel Clemens became somewhat of an abolitionist once he left Hannibal. He, uh, we acknowledge that he married into a, uh, a family of abolitionists, very wealthy family. His wife, Olivia, was not only uh, an abolitionist, I mean, she had learned this from, from the, her childhood, but uh, the neighbors were, 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 were the same, you know, had the same kind of mindset. And so he was surrounded about all, with, by all these new people and all this new thinking. And uh, the, the, there are many influences that, uh, that, that he had, not only in his early life, but, but throughout his life, if you will. Uh, this is uh, uh, his wife, Olivia. They were buried in 1870. He was, he was not a kid. He was in his 30s. Well, he's 35 when they, when they married. And so, uh, you know, he, he still had a lot to learn. And, and it seemed that he was open to learning and open to, to sharing his, not only his old Hannibal experience, but also his, uh, his um, you know, new life and, and, and the new people that he came in contact with. Uh, I, uh, I showed you a poster earlier of, the, of some of the, the people that, that were impacted by, uh, by um, Samuel Clemens. He, he, well, when he wasn't bankrupt and he was in a position, he was very generous and, and he helped people, he helped out particularly African-Americans in the pursuit of, uh, of happiness and the pursuit of, uh, you know, their goals, their dreams. And these, these are just a few of those people I'm going to talk about. This man, Warner T. McGuinn, is, is actually one of my favorites. And he's one of my favorites because of his impact, uh, because of his impact, uh, an unlikely impact on my own life. I, I was a, um, I attended a segregated school here in Hannibal. And Warner T. McGuinn, and, and in fact, Mark Twain, uh, impacted my life by, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a, a strange kind of way. McGuinn was going to uh, school. At, uh, well, he actually, he attended university, excuse me, he attended um, Lincoln University in Missouri for his undergrad. He went on to attend Howard University for a bit, but he ended up at the law school at, at Yale University. And here he graduated in, uh, he graduated from, from Yale in 1887. Along the way though, he met uh, uh, Samuel Clemens. Samuel Clemens was out there doing some sort of presentation. And uh, McGuinn approached him to say, you know, I'm, he knew him as a wealthy man. And he said, I'm really struggling here. And uh, I'm wondering if, uh, if, if you could offer me any assistance. So Twain, did some thinking on that. And then he wrote a letter back to the Dean. And, and these very powerful words I'm gonna read to you because it, it suggests uh, some form of, in my mind, I see it as a form of reparations. He said, uh, he said to the Dean as he, as he offered to pay McGuinn's uh, room and board through his uh, graduation uh, from Yale. He said, I do not believe I would very cheerfully help a white student who would ask a benevolence of a stranger, but I do not feel so about the other color. We have ground the manhood out of him, out of them, and the shame is ours, not theirs, and we should pay for it. That, that's just so powerful. And, and again, to me, he, he's acknowledging that, uh, that reparations may be a, a good thing. It may be something that, that we have to give more consideration to.
At any rate, this is Warner T. McGuinn. And, and, oh, I, I, I apologize. I, I, well, it says here on the, on the slide, but McGuinn became a mentor to Thurgood Marshall, our first black Supreme Court justice, but also the, the lead attorney for the uh, Brown versus Board of Education uh, lawsuit that, that we won and that, that was used to um, uh, integrate public education. And like I said, I was one of those kids that ended up at a, at a white school and, uh, um, you know, went on to, to do what I needed to do. But at any rate, it was Brown versus Board of Education, excuse me, Board of Education and Thurgood Marshall and Mark Twain that, that were responsible for that. Uh, he, uh, well, you, you, you know that he loved uh, to, to the storytelling uh, we, we've evident he has evidence of that throughout his work with uh, the the the, uh, uh, the the storytelling and the way he he used storytelling to uh, to accomplish what he wanted to accomplish. But he also loved African American music. He uh, this is this is the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Uh, Fisk Jubilee obviously is a university in Florida, and they they were in dire straits. And so they had determined that they needed to do a world tour. And so they did that. Twain uh, supported them. If he was in a place where they were performing, he would attend their performance. And he even, as I understand it, would, uh, would write flyers and, and encourage his friends and family to support the Fist Jubilee Singers as they traveled the world to raise funds that they sent back or they went back to, to sustain that university. Uh, John Lewis, John Lewis, well, he is considered a longtime friend, and obviously that's in quotes uh, of uh, Samuel Clemens, but he met him at the, the quarry farm, uh, where uh, this is a, a farm that his in-laws, excuse me, owned. Uh, the, the story that, that's told about John Lewis is that there was a, um, a, a, an incident where he saved the lives of of Livy and, and the children. There was a, a runaway horse and, and buggy and, and he somehow interceded and saved their lives. So he became kind of a lifelong friend of, of the Clemens family because of that. Uh, Charles Ethan Porter was an artist in Hartford. Uh, and again, well, this is no new news, but, but most artists are, are struggle, you know, to maintain a living. Uh, Samuel Clemens happened to come across one of his paintings, admired him, and wrote a letter to uh, to recommendation to to give him an opportunity to study. Excuse me, to study art in Paris. Uh, that uh, that enabled Charles Ethan Porter to to actually make a living selling his paintings uh, once he returned to Hartford. Uh, A.W. Wilson is, is another one that, that I admire uh, and that, that Twain obviously admired. He was a theology student and he attended Philadelphia's Lincoln University. And that, that's one of the oldest African-American colleges in, this, in the United States. At any rate, Clemens helped to finance his education. Um, I, um, I, I, I wish I could tell you more about how they met, where they met, but... but the backdrop to some of these stories are, are vague and, uh, you know, it takes a, a little more research than, than I can give you at this time. Uh, this is a, a man, uh, Blind Tom, Tom Wiggins. He was born enslaved and he wasn't blind and autistic, but he was an extraordinary talent. It seems that, that Twain was on one of his speaking engagements. He was taking a... Uh, uh, a train and I believe going cross country. I think he was traveling to Galena and he happened to hear uh, this commotion inside the train. Uh, you know, he was sitting in his seat and he heard all this noise, but it was, turned out it was, it was uh, Tom and he was uh, in, in his own way making the, the sounds of the train uh, crossing the country and, and, and it, was, it was unique and it was interesting, it was beautiful. Twain admired it and he started to attend and support Tom Wiggins as he became uh, uh, 
a, a novelty, if you will, and and, and did some uh, some um, you know perform throughout the the United States. Uh, and, and now Twain, uh, I, I didn't mean to give the impression that he only uh, influenced or, or oh, excuse me, uh, impacted the lives of, of African Americans. He he was all about human rights. And this is a woman, uh, a woman named Prudence Crandall. She was a, a white Quaker woman who decided that she was going to teach free black. Uh, excuse me. She was going to open her school up to uh, Negro girls uh, after, after the emancipation. And in doing that, she came under the, um, uh, came um, to be unappreciated by the white community in Hartford. And I mean, you don't necessarily think of, of the kind of hate and disdain that, that uh, uh, we know existed in the South, but here in Hartford, they, didn't like that, and and in the next slide you'll see where they uh, some Hartford citizens burned down her her school. She had to uh, leave Hartford. Hartford. She ended up in Kansas, poor and broke and 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 in need. And and Twain again intervened, and he was able to secure her um, her uh, a small pension for her, and made her life better. And um, you know he he was all about human rights. He was all about uh, about uh, helping the underdog, if you will. We're also very, very um, uh, fortunate to have this picture of uh, Sarah Harris Fairweather. At any rate, she was the first black student at uh, at Prudence School, and and she talks about uh, you know how that contributed to, to her life and her future, and enabled her dreams to come true. Uh, this is a woman that that Clements. Uh, she was a cook at the at the Clements home, and 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 actually, uh, Samuel Clements referred to her as Aunt, Aunt Rachel. He he, one evening, the, as the story goes, and, and you can hear this story online, and there are many storytellers that that do this. But it's the story of Aunt Rachel. She was a cook for Samuel. They one evening it. It goes that they were sitting on the, on the porch, kind of listening and enjoying one another's company. And uh, um, Samuel Clemens said to her, you know, you're such a, a, a happy person. You've never had any, any hardships. What a blessing. And she had to say, no, no, Twain, that is not my story. And she proceeded to tell him about her hardships, about the separation from her family and her children and 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 how painful that was and how painful her, her, her pre-emancipation uh, life really was. Uh, this story is actually published in the, um, uh, one of the, I'm sorry, I, I, forgive me for this, in one of the chronicles uh, out East. He published it and he got a lot of recognition for it, but, but, it's, but it's her story and it talks about the horrors of, of slavery. Uh, Clements, uh, it, it's, I, I get a, a good feeling thinking about our freedom fighters, such as Frederick Douglass, that he interacted with, that he interfaced with, that he impacted and, 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 and you know, moved their life along because of some little thing he did. Um, uh, Frederick Douglass, one of the stories that, that, that I'm fond of is, uh, he was about to lose his job as, uh, uh, and, and Twain, in fact, wrote a letter to then President uh, Garfield, I believe it was, at any rate, and, and secured him a, a lifetime federal position. But, but he also supported him with, with financially and fundraisers and letter writing and publications of, of various pro-Black uh, articles uh, supporting uh, the African-American causes. He was, uh, in my mind, an abolitionist and a, and a true humanitarian. W.B. Du Bois, uh, a prominent civil rights leader and founder of the NAACP, he supported him in, in the same way. And one of the things that, that he did was uh, he uh, wrote a review of uh, Mr. Du Bois' uh, autobiography. 
and uh, recommended that, that people read it black and white. And uh, uh, this, of course, contributed to his success. He also, I, I also have an image from one of the, um, I think it's the next one, um, Emily, of, uh, of Twain in the audience. And this is from a New York Times photo archives where, um, uh, oh, excuse me, Booker T. Washington was actually doing a, uh, a, a fundraiser and Clemens attended and he wrote a review. Oh, I'm sorry, he attended and he, and he did a lot to uh, support also Booker T. Washington. Um, it, it's kind of interesting to see this photograph of him in attendance, but, uh, but that happened and, and it uh, again supports my belief of Twain the Humanitarian. Uh, this is a statue, and I, I showed it to you earlier, but, uh, but I, I, I want to show it to you again because it's located not in our downtown historic district. Uh, you know, I told you Hannibal uh, Towns, everything Twain uh, does not, Twain the Humanitarian does not get the recognition I think he should get. The, this statue of him is, is again located on the outskirts of town almost in, in one of our parks. And it was uh, it was contributed at the uh, uh, you know late in his life. At any rate, the, it it reads you, you'll see that that his religion was humanity, and a whole world mourned for him when he died. And he was it was erected by the state of Missouri in 1913. So that was that was sometime after his death. But again, it was um, it, it's not part of of what we call the, the, the tourist or the historic district in Hannibal. Twain the Humanitarian. Uh, lastly, I, I want to, uh, you know, thank you for listening. I invite you to visit us here at Jim's Journey. These are some photographs of the museum. We are, uh, we are in one of the oldest buildings in Hannibal. It's, it's called the, uh, Twain refers to it as the Welshman House in Tom Sawyer and you visit, you'll learn about not only about Twain the Humanitarian and, and some of the things that I've talked about here today, but you'll learn about the African-American community and, and contributions, uh, achievements, uh, uh, struggles um, th in this town that, that uh, is everything Twain, we, we offer you, we offer you the only uh, memorial to Daniel Quarles, one of the prototypes for Jim and Huckleberry Finn. And uh, again, uh, we're going to be opening up here at the Memorial Day weekend. And uh, I encourage you to visit. And at the if you can't visit, please check us out at jimsjourney.org. Thank you so much, Faye. I'm going to leave this slide up. And uh, if anyone has questions for Faye, please put them in the Q&A and we'll get to those, but I've got a few questions too, so I'll start. Um, I was curious about, you know, you mentioned at the very beginning <clears throat> how you were uh, sort of had a set of beliefs about Twain's books and in particular about Huckleberry Finn and um, his use of language in those books. And I'm curious what you, if you talk to people about that now too, and what you would say to people who, um, there are still people who feel that those books should not be taught in schools and that book is one of the ones that pops up on the banned book list periodically and things like that so i'm curious what your um what you say about that now what your response is to that now good and i do get that question i uh my belief is that twain the the, the use of the word is was appropriate and it was necessary and it uh, it was uh it should not be removed because if if you remove it people won't believe or they may not believe how tough those times were, how dehumanizing those times were. And, and uh, you know, you got to keep it in. That's the story. That's the language that was used. So we got to tell it like that. Mm. I, 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 I do have an opportunity every, every year. I've, I've done this. I get to, um, to, our Mark Twain Museum uh, offers uh, 
how to teach Huck. It's a, it's a course mm -hmm. that they offer. And for the past few years, I've invited people to visit Jim's journey so they can get a sense for, for how to teach Huck and, and what life was like, uh, uh, really like in Hannibal and not, not the fanciful uh, Tom and Becky story. So, yeah. um, you know, that, that, that's my contribution to how to teach Huck. <laughs> I do have a question from a viewer. First of all, complimenting you and thanking you for the presentation and all this, this great information, um, but also curious about kind of what sparked your, your journey uh, in learning about this and doing this research and not just learning about it for yourself, but really going that extra step to make this um, a public you know, institution, a museum. Oh, good, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I told you I'm a Hannibal native. I uh, went away, uh, as, grew as a person. I attended the University of Michigan, was on several boards, lived in Chicago. You know, I did some things similar to the life that, that Twain lived, uh, you know, in terms of exposure. Mm -hmm. I, uh, my husband retired, we moved back to Hannibal. We had a farm here. So we moved back, I attended a, an event. It was called Historical Hannibal. And there was only, well, first of all, they refer to the gentler, kinder slavery that, uh, that, that was experienced here in Hannibal. And then also there was just one photograph of a church and one photograph of our segregated school. I approached the curator to say that, you know, I think there's more to our story than that. And he invited me to go tell it. So I did. I wrote an article, I published it in a couple of newspapers. I told people I wanted to do this and that it was time that we do this. And people responded, I got, I have, uh, I'm the, this is sort of sad to say, but I have about 600 items in that little building that talk about the, the life and, and the experience of African-Americans here in Missouri, uh, excuse me, here in Hannibal, particularly Northeast Missouri. At any rate, I did it out of uh, frustration I did it out of um, anger. I did it out of just a pure need to tell it. It wasn't being told. And what did it take to get the, the Freedom Center open? Uh, I, I had to write grants. Yeah. I, uh, this property happens to belong to the city of Hannibal. And I, I became active on our local historical board they were using the building to, for storage. Mm -hmm. And I, um, because of its history, I approached them and, and they, <coughs> excuse me, agreed to let us have it. It's um, like I said, it was used for storage, but it was formerly, you, it was built by enslaved people pre-1837. <clears throat> it was, it's had many uses obviously, but one that, that I like and one that I like to tell is that was used to store ammunition by Union soldiers during the, during the Civil War. So that, uh, you know, I approached the city, they gave it to me that I lease it for $1 a year. Wow. <laughs> That's a cool story. Um, I was curious about, you know, you talked about, he, he moved to Hartford and we know that um, clearly it was not a, you moved to Hartford and there's no racism there. We, we heard the story of Prudence Crandall. And I'm sure that was not an isolated incidence of ra incident of racism in, in Hartford, but I am curious if you have any sense, and I know this is difficult to quantify, but if you have any sense of how much his views shifted with moving out of a, of a pro-slavery state, um, you know, it sounded like he had some, certainly some of the visuals he had as a child impacted him, but, but had he started to really shift his um, views on abolition and things like that prior to moving, or did that really happen in Hartford? You know what, I'm going to say it probably start, started to happen as he began to travel. One of the things he also did was he wrote about one of the places he ended up was San Francisco and he worked for a newspaper there. And he started to write articles about the mistreatment of the Chinese who were there mm -hmm. working on, uh, you know, as laborers. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it started before the marriage to, to Livy and before the, um, uh, hit her family got a hold of him. Interesting. I know that's hard to, it's hard to track in a person's, you know, psychological shift, but 
Um, that's interesting to see that. I'm going to go look up those articles now too. I've not read those. Oh, yes. I'm, <laughs> I'm curious, do you know if his parents who owned slaves, if they were alive to see some of this shift or, and, and how they, is there any record of how they responded or how he uh, navigated that with his family back in Hannibal? I, I'm going to say, I'm not sure. I, I, uh, okay. I don't have it in my brain, you know, when, uh, when, when his parent was, well, his, da his dad died. He was a kid when his dad died. Okay. So I'm going to say that, that he did not see this, this transition. His mm -hmm. mother by that time was living in Iowa with, with one of her sons. And, um, I don't know. She may have seen some of it. I, I would, I would say yes. He tells a story in one of his books about his mother, about there being a, a I think the slave enslaved kid was named Sandy and had been, they had somehow knew, somehow they knew he was from Maryland. And mm -hmm. uh, Sandy did a lot, of, a lot of humming and singing, a lot of racket, a lot, just always a lot of stuff going on. At any rate, San, uh, Twain found himself complaining about it and ask uh, his mother, she'd shut him up. And uh, the mother replied that he had lost his family. And, and that's kind of the way mm. he, he managed it, if you will, but by mm. keeping his lane, you know, always, always kind of keeping this happiness going, if you will. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, so she was, you know, I, I like that moment that he shares with us about her. And we're so lucky we have so many. He was so prolific with his writing that we do get to see. And on so many different, not just the books, but he said articles and oh, letters and all articles of those things. and essays and yes, yes. So what's the, I, I we're getting, coming to a close, but I guess I'm curious, is there any kind of gap in your research or mystery that you've been trying to, to research more, uh, a story that you, you're just dying to know more about uh, that you haven't been able to, to sort of crack yet? Well, there are, I have, I mentioned this, I have a lot of artifacts in the museum. Mm -hmm. I grew up here uh, and there was, uh, the, the State Historical Society had put all these landmarks throughout the city and they were these big iron um, uh, pieces, if you will, and they had different writing on them. And, and, and all the time I was growing up, there was one at the riverfront and it was the only reference to African-Americans and it referred to Huck Finn and Nigger Jim traveling the Mississippi River. Well, luckily I have a photograph of, of that, but I would love to have that, 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 that piece of, uh, uh, you know, that monument, if you will. And, 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 you know, it's disappeared and, yeah. and that's, you know, that's what happens. I, my, my goal now is to, to put, pull together a, a monument for African-Americans in this town that's all things Twain. There's, yeah. there's nothing for Jim, nothing for, her, uh, you know, nothing for Daniel Quarles, the prototype for Jim. And, and if you come here, um, you know, unless you stumble onto Jim's journey, mm -hmm. you are not going to know the story. You're not gonna realize this story. I, in, in doing some research for this, I, I looked up the timeline for that, that the museum has, Mark Twain Museum has uh, available for Mark Twain's life or Samuel Clemens life. And nowhere in his timeline do they mention the, the people or the, the things that I, that I shared with you today. Yeah. So, you know, so there, there's lots of fixes and lots of holes and things that, that I'd like to see changed. Well, I look forward to seeing the monument. I have no doubt that you'll make that happen. <laughs> I mean, I just based on everything else you've already done, I have no doubt. And uh, I think we're, we're about at the end of our time. So I'm gonna say thank you, Faye, again to you for sharing these stories with us um, that really are hard to find anywhere else. I'm gonna thank once more our Mighty Mississippi sponsors, um, our presenting sponsor, Bank of America, as well as our education sponsor, JSM Charitable Trust. Thank you for joining us today and being Good. a part of this program. I appreciate that. And um, if you want to see, I hope you're going to join us for some other programs coming up. I've got a few of them listed here on your screen. And of course, again, you can find those at mohistory.org or on the Missouri Historical Society, our Missouri History Museum Facebook page. 
Um, again, you'll be able to find this program on the YouTube channel for Missouri Historical Society. So if you enjoyed it, go back and watch it again, give it a thumbs up, share it with uh, friends and family. And don't forget to fill out that survey that should have popped up on your screen um, so you can let us know what you thought. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you again next time. Take care. Good, good. Yes, thank you. Thank you.